Neil, hi, it's a real pleasure to have you join us today. Um, as you know, we're doing a series of filming um, events where we're talking about um, the Macular Degeneration Service in Amersham, how we set it up, um, but more importantly, what we have been doing up until now is um, looking at patient education um, and trying to get patients involved in activities and trying to show them that they can actually do a lot, even with um, eyesight that might not be um, normal, but hopefully, um, a lot better now that they're having treatment for their macular degeneration. But I thought um, it'd be really nice to go back to the beginning of the journey. We, um, I joined the trust in two thousand, at the end of two thousand and thirteen, and quite quickly realised that we had a challenge, um, and we had to try and um, um, try and deal with that challenge. But it was also a great opportunity. And at the time, I was introduced to yourself. And I can't remember what exactly was your role at the time. Yeah. So I was. Yes, yeah, so that was my job, not the one before this one, but the one before that one. So I was the sort of director, for, divisional director for surgery at the time. That's right. And I remember somebody saying to me, um, you need to get Neil on board, because if you get Neil on board, then you'll be fine, everything will happen. So I remember we had quite a long journey. It was quite, it was quite unusual at the time, because we, we got some partners outside of the NHS to get involved as well. But I, and I, it was, from my point of view, it was um, the first time I'd ever sort of got involved as a project that big. And, in terms of service development. But right at the very start, I think we um, were both keen to make sure we had stakeholders um, from all across the board involved as well, including patients and CCG. Um, and I think that the beginning part of that journey was probably the longest, um, but I think it was the most important because until we actually made that decision that we wanted to set up a, um, a one-stop service in Amersham, I think it was quite a long journey to be had. Um, but do you, do you remember, I, you probably can't, I mean obviously it's been five years. <laughs> I, 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 I struggled to remember much before March last year. Uh, <laughs> That's right. but, yeah, no, I do, I mean, I, it was, um, I think that so part of my job, even my job now really, is to uh, take ideas that clinical teams have about how to do things better for them, their yeah. patients or the taxpayer or hopefully all three at the same time and I guess to try and um, make a judgment really about kind of is this realistic, is it a goer, uh, and if it is, what can I do to help, or what can we do to help? And I, I think that I mean I particularly remember in the ophthalmology service at the time it was still you guys were like most ophthalmology services I think kind of almost um, uh, wilting against a tsunami of demand, trying to be managed with probably not enough people and certainly in a methodology that wasn't quite right, very traditional outpatient model, everybody sitting in their own rooms, um, multiple handoffs. So actually for a, a manager really, to have a clinician that comes, I mean, you know, finding a clinician or clinicians with a really good idea that is really innovative, um, yeah, it's just a dream really. And I think also you came with a bit of access to money as well, which always kind of... We did. Um, uh, helps lubricate the uh, decision making process. That's right. And, and I remember what I remember from that time was that I think you were very good at, at helping me personally understand okay, these are the key sort of pressure points. And if you can, if you can sort of come at, at the project from diff these particular angles, and one of them being obviously money, um, then you kind of tick, you tick enough boxes to get everybody on board and get, and get things moving. But you're absolutely right. Money was, uh, that was one of the factors, and it was. It, it was a, a little bit of a. It was a little bit unusual because we hadn't actually done a project before. I believe in the trust where we had done a partnership with, where some of the funding was coming from outside of the NHS. Um, but I, I remember. I think you know. Once you understood. I think once you understood um, that that wasn't going to impact the patient's care or the care that provided, and it was still going to be completely independent. I think then you helped make sure that everybody else understood that as well. Yeah. Because you had a couple of, there was a couple of key resourcing pin. Well, there was lots of resourcing pinch points, but the key ones really were, as I remember them. One, um, in and amongst everything we got to do, could we do some properly resourced and sophisticated modelling about what the future looked like, and we were able to get some help with that, rather than obviously just rely on our own folk who were, you know, often buried in statutory and regulatory returns. Yeah. There was obviously some environmental changes that we, we did which was really helpful to get that support for because again our my estate team are often just got quite the, got their kind of um, nose to the grindstone in terms of just making sure all the maintenance and kind of statutory stuff is 
is kept on top of that. I think the estates bit was really important, wasn't it, in terms of the physical flow. And actually, we've proved it in subsequent projects with the cataract stuff. That actually, if you get your space right, absolutely, which is one of our problems because our space isn't, you know, it's 20, 30, 40, even a bit longer, 50 years old, and it's not designed for modern practices. So um, that was a key bit. And the other bit was around our commissioners at the time, so the people who pay us, because we were on a you know, cost and volume contract, so we were being paid by activity, and you know, we were obviously projecting some quite large activity increases, which always makes commissioners go, Ugh. and I think at the same time, it was, there was probably an active Lucentis or Avastin debate. There's, there's always that debate. Going on, <laughs> yeah, that kind of came around every kind of 12 months, and the complexities around that, which is probably too boring to go into here, but... Um, yeah, um, in, the, in the space thing, I think it was really important because I remember at the time I had in my my mind an idea of what we needed to get that flow right, um, but it was hard to get that across to to everybody else who'd been used to that one room, one doctor model, um, and just thinking about okay, we've got this space, how can we eke out a little bit more in that space? So I remember actually driving around all the different units and sort of walking around Amersham aimlessly, walking around Wickham and trying to find, you know, and you know, I went to the eye department in Amersham that was there at the time, thinking this is perfect. And all it needed was that, um, you know, that, that little bit of a push and that little bit of, well, you shouldn't excuse the pun, to, to sort of see how that room, that space could be transformed. Um, and that space now is you know, completely unre unrecognisable to what it was like before. Um, but that support from the key people, I think, was absolutely crucial for that. And from my point of view, it was very much driven by trying to do what's best for the patient. But I had a quite a steep learning curve to realise that. Um, what's best for the patient ultimately has so many steps along the way um, where other people have different priorities that feed into that. And I think there was, there was another key decision as well, wasn't there? I think now starting, things are starting to come back a bit around um, you know, the movement from Stone Mandeville, Aylesbury to Amersham. Because yeah. obviously you know, our, the two main population centres for this trust are Wickham and Aylesbury. And so a decision to move a key service offering to a part of the county where the population is, um, uh, well, there's, 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 there's a small population, and also it's the you know it's in terms of accessibility for um, the population in terms of people who can't afford to have a car, and uh, so there was there was a quite a long debate about that. I seem to remember, and actually it was, yeah, yeah. making the argument that actually we could, if you create something that I'm going to make up numbers can see five thousand people instead of two thousand people. As it is, and the overall benefit of, of that um, is because uh, it was physically impossible in the current in situ at State Mandeville, the global benefit counteracts some of that. And you know, obviously, you guys still have a local service for people who um, can't access um, the, the main hub, really. But yeah, I remember that was, being, was quite a tricky bit for us to get through. And I think the, the other key argument to, uh, for that was that um, before the Amersham service was set up, patients were having to make two separate journeys to, That's right. to be yeah, seen yeah. and then to come back to have their treatment and each one of those appointments was sort of three or four hours long and we condensed those two journeys and two visits into one visit which was only an hour so you know and almost universe, universally all the people who initially were um, uh, you know not happy about having to travel to Amersham you know people in north of the county for example when they realised that actually they would save one visit and it was a much shorter visit and they knew exactly what would happen, almost universally they all, they all said that we'd rather come to Amersham rather than yeah. go back to the old way of doing things. Because we, uh, we did some testing of that, didn't we? We did. Was, yeah. We did, absolutely. We kind of, yeah, there was quite a lot of... And I think that's what... We, it's sometimes easy to forget because it was five years ago, you know, well, over five years ago, because we started the service five years ago, but there was sort of a year or two years worth of work that went into before we started and that... There was actually a lot of work that went into that, and but I think one of the key messages, or one of the key messages I would give if anybody was going to set up a new service again, is it's worth putting that time in at the beginning. Um, so when I first came there, I wanted to set something up and get going within, you know, within a few weeks. And I think that was a bit naive, obviously, but if we hadn't put that groundwork in and, and got everybody on board and um, got everybody's input, I think we wouldn't have been as successful as we were. Uh, and the other, one of the other interesting bits, I think, was around the, the design of the facility, which is, you know, to be, it's not a huge space. Um, uh, one of the common pitfalls, I think, particularly um, working as non-kind of architects and kind of people who know ergonomics and flow, is that when we embark on kind of designing stuff, 
you know, we, we do get a bit excitable and kind of everybody wants kind of very big kind of spaces and big rooms and uh, and quite understandably kind of all the latest kind of mod cons etc. But actually, the, with the proper design of that space, compared with some stuff we did, was quite cheap to 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 engineer because it was actually what was important to us was not kind of everybody with their own rooms and their own kind of space and but actually a, where you can have line of um, you can have the view of everybody kind of through the flow bit that you just work for the patient through the treatment room kind of out the other side so you know comparatively if you look at the the economics of how that space was used previously to how it's used now with a relatively cheap adjustment yeah. it, the productivity you know was 20 percent kind of like you know much 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 more than it kind of was Absolutely, and I think we, we did quite a bit of work with the modelling, as you said, even later on, we tweaked it, and uh, Marcus uh, and I, we, we talked in another video about how we tweaked the model and sort of got the, that efficiency up, you know, further and further up, and then that gave us a basis trip for, during COVID, to be probably one of the only services in the country that carried on with some further tweaks, and we kind of used that model where we got the whole team involved and everybody had their input, um, because you know, we we realised very early on that the patient's journey isn't just seeing the doctor. It's you know, there's so many touch points, and you need everybody who's involved in those touch points to give their opinion about how they can make it safe and how they can make it more efficient. So we kind of carried on with that thinking and, and the whole team getting involved, and and it very much does still feel like a you know, a, a team um, a team service. It's a team led service, including the patients um, as well. Um, so from our point of view, it, it was it was a, you know for me it was a. a most of the journey was up until that point when we started, but over the last five years we've carried on improving and and, um, and obviously your journey in the last five years has changed as well uh, massively. From from my point of view, it's um, the the real pleasure has been in seeing our patients getting the treatment that they need, being able to maintain their vision and still seeing. If you if anyone gets a chance to go into the department now, they can even see artwork, for example, from patients who managed to continue painting or drawing and and, uh, and do the sort of things they were doing before because we've managed to keep their eyesight. From your point of view, you you know, macular degeneration service is is such a tiny part of what you look after now as as chief executive. So obviously you know you you look after thousands of staff who have hundreds of different departments and services and hundreds of thousands if not more patients who come through um, uh, the, the trust. That you're now sort of you know um, at the head of. When you get involved in projects like this, um, obviously not to the same degree now as chief, chief executive. But how do you? What's kind of what drives you from you know for, as a clinician? It's really easy. What drives me is, is my patient who uh, you know with that particular condition and seeing them do well. But what drives you for uh, with regards to the different you know there's so many different projects that you obviously have oversight over. Yeah. So. So you know, there's, there's clearly there's a, a limit to what I can personally do. I mean, I think I've got I try and keep two things really. I mean, and there's clearly a range of projects. There's something like this, which was a fairly sizable project, but you know, um, compared to having to rebuild an A&E department or something, yeah, there's, there's clearly a, a kind of spectrum of scale that determines kind of my personal involvement in that. Uh, um, I guess the, the two things that are really important. One is that. Um, my job as the chief executive is to set the culture of the organisation, um, and uh, part of that is creating, uh, I guess, the environment that is in all, all parts of the organisation. That if a clinician has a good idea and a manager um, is there to support, they can do the same thing. Because um, you know, if I'm trying to be involved with everything, nothing will get done. So I need to create a culture and environment where. Good ideas can work. You know, clinicians, managers, support services, IT, estates can work in partnership to deliver. Because quite often the smallest changes are probably the most impactful. And then the second one, really, and the bit that was really struck with this project was, is that you know I can remember looking at all the modelling and kind of the numbers and the potential demand, etc. And we've got this fantastic drug that can do this thing that people can now stop, you know, becoming blind. Um, but with all those projections of numbers and you're talking to your commissioners about funding it, it's thousands and thousands of patients. Um, and sometimes I think ophthalmology, um, what I learned from the project was ophthalmology, you know, it's not someone in a car crash coming into A&E, you know, any of the critical care with broken bones, but the impact of 
not fixing someone's eyes is so disabling to that person, not only for them individually, their ability to drive, to change their life, but if you look at the overall economic impact of that as well, in terms of their ability to work and be you know, um, an active member of, you know, as they were in society, and hearing some of those individual stories and um, understanding for a little simple injection that's done well in a really sick environment, the magnification of the impact on that individual. I, I think sometimes one of the challenges of being a manager is that the numbers, you need to understand the impact on the humans underneath some of the numbers, I think, and that was quite a compelling example of um, something that I think, don't think traditionally had featured in um, the public's kind of forefront of their, their minds, but actually, you know, thousands of people a year are living active, normal lives as they always have done because we're able to do this project. So that's a great example. Thank you. Well, Neil, thank you very much for joining us and taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule. And from me and from my patients, thank you very much for getting no, no. involved right from the start and still supporting us now going forward. You're very welcome. Thank you very much.